pleasure of introducing our final speaker. Rhody Pike is a friend, a colleague, a heart failure guru, and just an all round awesome boy. So he hails from Newfoundland. Rhody is a nurse practitioner in a heart function clinic. And whenever I have a heart failure, heart function question, he and Karen Harkness are my go-to people in Canada. And I think it's wonderful that we have nurses and nurse practitioners that are really our go-to people with heart failure. So without further ado, Rhody, I will ask you to share your screen and uh, entertain us and educate us as only you can do. So there's a little, should be a little green button at the bottom that says share screen. And when you move your mouse, yes. And I will mute my mic and enjoy the presentation. Okay, I'm not, uh, my presentation is not up. If, um, if you go back into share, so it'll come up and it'll ask you what it wants to share. So just, um, there we go. Awesome. I recognize that handsome boy. <laughs> yeah, I wonder who came up with the picture. Uh, again, I would like to thank everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, present at this conference. Uh, as a uh, past board member with CCCN, it uh, does my heart good here on a Thursday afternoon to look and see over 211 uh, participants online for a virtual uh, meeting. And sometimes, uh, you know, it was even difficult to achieve that in person. So uh, awesome. Um, great to see the commitment to our uh, voice of cardiovascular nursing in Canada. Uh, so to get us started, just some uh, conflict of interest. I have received honorary for those companies, and I have uh, also received uh, consulting fees from industry as well. Uh, the opinions that I sort of bring forth here are the guidelines as they are presented. And uh, so looking at some objectives, we're gonna just look at a, an overview of what heart failure is and the impact it has uh, across the country. Review current medication guidelines for heart failure management. Provide an overview of device therapy and heart failure management and discuss self-care activities uh, when looking or caring for patients with heart failure. So getting on to the uh, first definition, uh, when we look at heart failure, it's a condition, of course, where the heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet the demands of the body. So historically, we always came up with the term congestive heart failure. But we've sort of gotten away from that term, or we, we have gotten away from it, because people, of course, can have significant symptoms of heart failure without always being congested. And to that end, the symptoms that they most often complain about is shortness of breath, dyspnea, which is dyspnea, fatigue, and swelling. And to undermine uh, trying to get a handle on what the patient is describing when, when they're fatigued or shortness of breath, uh, is very important to uh, ascertain from a history from a patient. When we look at ejection fraction, which sort of stratifies as to the type of heart failure we have, and what I mean by the type is generally two types of heart failure, the half ref and the half pef. And if we look at a normal ejection fraction, that's the amount of blood that's ejected out of the ventricle with each beat, which normally goes at about 55%. And so the amount of blood that it takes in relative to what it squeezes out, that's how we get at that number. When we look at heart muscle where the heart is becomes dilated or the heart muscle becomes weakened and has the inability to pump blood the way it, it should, then when the ejection fraction is less than 40%, we call that half ref or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Unlike its counterpart where we have half path, the heart muscle here becomes thickened. And as you can see, if we look over here to the left, that's a normal chamber. When we look here to the right, the chamber is much smaller. So the amount that you take in, you still may pump out the right amount, half of what you're taking in, 
but what you're starting off with in the beginning is much less. Unfortunately for patients with half PEF, there's not a lot of medications to actually treat for modifying the disease and reversing the process. It's more about treating other comorbidities that exist with it and uh, keeping things under control, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, so on and so forth. So for all intents and purposes, today's presentation will focus mostly on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the therapies that we currently come into play. When we look back on a uh, paper that was put out by the Heart and Stroke Foundation in 2016, it says Canada is spanning our heart failure patients and the whole impact the heart failure is having uh, within this patient population. We know that it's on the rise with about 600,000 Canadians living with heart failure and about 50,000 are diagnosed each year. One in two Canadians have been touched by heart failure and that's either through friends, family, colleagues, or generally knowing somebody that's been given a diagnosis of heart failure. And what's even more staggering is the cost of heart failure at uh, about 2.8 billion per year. When you look at the amount of time that's lost from work, family that loses time from work for either caring for the individuals, the burden of admitting patients to hospital and the cost of uh, medications which is continuously on the rise as we get with new and more novel therapies. Heart failure patients have long and frequent hospital stays and uh, most all the studies that you see coming out surrounding heart failure it's combined primary endpoint of reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and death from heart failure. There is no cure for heart failure. Uh, it's manage, managing the symptoms unless the patient goes on to advanced heart failure therapies. The patients are often uh, complex and they're managing other conditions such as obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, uh, and a lot of other chronic conditions. Patients experience shortness of breath, exhaustion and swelling and are oftentimes overburdened with their symptoms and uh, that's what we try to do is to improve on those symptoms, improve quality of life and improve overall outcomes. And of course, we wouldn't be all inclusive with just managing the patient without having consideration for the holistic perspective of caring for heart failure caregivers as well, who come in with those patients and they're often overwhelmed and stressed with the large burden that's been placed on them in caring for that particular family member. This is an old slide and it's out of uh, the Scotland and it's uh, looking at heart failure being more malignant than cancer so that when you look at most heart failure, most cancers, heart failure has a worse outcome than most of those kind of cancers. It really is an end stage heart disease, of course, other than lung cancer. To look at heart failure without looking at the trajectory and the sort of how it goes along from the time of initial diagnosis uh, to we in the, get into advanced care planning or end of life care. Uh, the patient in step one, or as you can see by the one here, is the first episodic exposure to heart failure given the diagnosis and the workup goes along with it and more times than not three during the emergency department or admitted to hospital for the extensive uh, workup to identify what it is that's going on and of course the person then gets placed on therapies they become stabilized but at any point they can start to peter down and have episodic either readmissions or decompensations in heart failure and when they recover generally we don't see the, re the recover back to the previous episode and you got that gradual uh, often decline in heart failure in, in the symptoms and in their overall condition. Now at any point here uh, we can also have uh, patients have sudden death and of course that's a target of uh, device therapy it goes in and uh, we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation and then if we get continued or ongoing decrease in uh, patient symptoms or worsening of patient symptoms and a decrease in their overall health then we may have to look at advanced heart failure therapy such as transplant or uh, assist devices when we look at heart failure it's really important to look at it and know how to classify it and when the person comes in uh, look at their level of functional impairment. And that's often done with the NYHA or New York Heart Association classification system. And it's everything from a class one to a class four. 
with class one symptoms being no symptoms at all. They feel no shortness of breath. They feel no fatigue, no orthopnea, no PND. They can get up and carry it a day, day to day without any issues. Class two is symptoms with ordinary activities such as they, uh, you know, try to walk up a hill upstairs. Um, you know, they start getting mild symptoms of heart failure, some shortness of breath, a bit fatigued at the end of the day. Then you got your NYHA class three, which is symptoms with less than ordinary activity. So, you know, just going to the washroom, they're trying to bathe, uh, shower, and it's causing undue um, symptoms such as dyspnea and fatigue. And we classify that as moderate symptoms. Sometimes you will even see uh, NYHA class three A and three B. That's just to differentiate that there's occasional times that a person has uh, symptoms at rest, but is not there persistently, uh, that they may fluctuate back and forth. So they're not quite a three, they're not quite a four. So we do sometimes make that differentiation. And class four, of course, is symptoms at rest. Patients often fluctuate uh, between classes and you can come into hospital in your first admission, be grossly volume overloaded, uh, shortness of breath, just sitting in the exam room. Uh, and then with the uh, decongestive phase, we give you diuretics, get you on some anti-heart failure therapy and you see an improvement in symptoms. Big thing to note with MYHA class, that's not related to ejection fraction. So because I have an ejection fraction in half rev of 9% doesn't mean I'm going to have a worse NYHA class. Set to that example is a patient that I cared for that had an ejection fraction of 11%, but he was still able to maintain his business and go out and lay hardwood floor and finish the hardwood floor and not really have any symptoms. And you would anticipate maybe class four. The other extreme I've seen as well with patients who've improved to an ejection fraction from 20 to 38, but they have quite significant symptoms and are a class three heart failure. So just to sort of make that uh, uh, make that note. So when the body uh, or when the heart has inadequate cardiac output or the body in our ejection fraction falls below 40, uh, we have activation of our renin angiotensin aldosterone system or our RAS system and the sympathetic nervous system. So in emergency situations and initially, that is quite an adaptive response that you get your increase in heart rate. Uh, to increase vasoconstriction, conserve water, uh, sodium and water, all of it with the goal of keeping perfusion going, especially to vital organs. And then over time, that becomes very deleterious over days and days and days of activating this system and the heart kind of starts to take on a different shape, becomes big, you get this enlarged heart, fluid retention, and the patient and the heart becomes very tired. And that's when we get into the whole heart failure system System. So those systems, in particular the RAS and the sympathetic nervous system, is where we get a lot of our targeted therapies with the whole goal of acting on these systems to actually prevent the uh, activation of the RAS and the sympathetic nervous system. So we're trying to shut things off. So we know what the current medications that we have uh, are all, they improve symptoms, improve quality of life, and of course they have a mortality benefit. When we initiate these therapies to help unwanted side effects, we often start at very small doses and that titrate to targeted doses over time. Because the whole goal is to get symptom improvement, less fluid retention, and make the heart muscle and stronger again. Now, when we talk about guidelines, of course, there was an update in 2020 and I looked at mitral valves, looked at the place of, or the role of SGLT2 inhibitors, which we will talk about, and uh, also uh, looking at amyloid and tefamidus uh, as a treatment for it. So rather than getting into all these other complex issues with heart failure, I thought it'd be good to go back and look at what are the current therapies that we employ right from the get-go with these patients. Now, historically, it's always been called triple therapy is the foundation of pharmacological management. Unfor not unfortunately, fortunately for us and for uh, heart failure patients, that has now changed and there's additional meds beyond the initial triple therapy. 
And I think more and more uh, you're going to be seeing it called combined therapies. And it's going to be interesting to see if any statements come out from the uh, CCCS guidelines uh, in, uh, at our CCCS Congress in October of this year. So when heart failure is, when ejection fraction is less than 40 and your symptoms, we initially start patients off on ACE inhibitors uh, or an ARB. ACE might be able to tolerate due to a cough, uh, so we put them under ARBs. And then sometimes very early on, we may even switch them over to a nephrolysis inhib inhibitor or what we call an ARNI, which is a new class of medications probably undergo in about uh, three or four years from the Paradigm Heart Failure Study. Uh, beta blockers, uh, of course, we institute those very early as well, as long as the person is not grossly volume overloaded. And then we also introduce mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So in addition to the ACE, ARBs, ARNIs, so that's three, the beta blocker and the MRAs, we're beyond a triple therapy in that the most recent studies coming out from the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, especially with the two, uh, the DAPA-HF and uh, EMPA, uh, heart failure Emperor Heart Failure Trial that was uh, just recently released at ESC, we're seeing the role for SGLT2 inhibitors coming into play. Also uh, with patients, uh, we have ivabradine, which is very specific use in patients with increased heart rate who uh, beta blocker is not achieving that. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in detail. Also a good part about, you know, we look at the triple therapy, our ACE inhibitors, our ARBs, beta blockers, and then along came the ARNIs and just sort of where they fit in in terms of the whole RAS system. So we know that we got activation of a RAS sympathetic nervous system, but we also know that when people have heart failure, there's a release of natriuretic peptides in response to all stress in the left ventricle. When that actually happens, they, they offer good benefit and we want to keep them around. They uh, promote vasodilatation, decrease your sympathetic tone, decrease aldosterone so you get rid of that salt and water and diuresis, naturesis, and they de decrease heart failure symptoms and slow disease progression. But when natriuretic peptides are released and they start becoming available in the body, we get necrolysin that is released that breaks down those um, natriuretic peptides into inactive fragments. So what we do, so what has been done is a neprolysin inhibitor, secubitril, and that allows natriuretic peptides to stay in circulation. But what you gotta remember is that the natriuretic peptides themselves, when they remain, they're really good but it also helps break down the angio too. So therefore, when we got a system that's activating the RAS system, we needed to put in an ARB as well, or an angiotensin receptor blocker, because we do not want more uh, angio two around. So therefore, we're paired with secubitril valsartan. So Entresto, as we know it uh, within the clinical environment, is a medication that's dual and based on the whole uh, natriuretic peptide system. When we put all these medications into practice, uh, they're all to goal-directed targets. And of course, all these medications from studies show that they improve survival, improves quality of life, and symptom improvement. Practical tip is to start really slow with the doses and um, just monitor our effects. So when we look at our uh, evidence-based medications, such as our ACE inhibitors, We've got all the ills, as I call them, and that's our initial starting dose and our target dose. And then we have our ARBs as well, which is our candesartan and valsartan. And of course, down the bottom, we have our ARNIs. Uh, depending on where you practice, depends on whether you're allowed to write the dosage like that. Here in Newfoundland, I'm not permitted to write 50 twice a day or 200 twice twice a day, I have to write down to two individual ingredients. So basically it's the 24.3 of Secubitril and then the Valsartan. So with the ACE, ARBs, or ARNIs, and more and more we're uh, as quickly as we can, we try to switch over the ARNIs, uh, switch over the ACE and ARBs to the ARNIs uh, to get that uh, benefit from that medication. Uh, very important to have a serum uh, renal function uh, baseline serum renal function and potassium level. And then when we do these titrations, we're generally in the heart function clinic every two weeks, recheck the potassium and the uh, creatinine within seven to, day, seven to 10 days following dosage adjustment. We may see serum creatinine levels rise up to about 30%. That's not unexpected. 
A lot of people get stressed out about uh, asymptomatic low blood pressure. So you know your patient all of a sudden got a pressure in 92, probably down to 88, and they feel fine. There's no evidence of worsening creatinine, no decrease in their mentation, nothing to indicate that there's damage to end organ perfusion. So what we need to do is sort of look, okay, this patient's completely asymptomatic, uh, the heart failure therapy is going to be there to remodel or reshape. So we sort of keep things as they are. Sometimes we had to get quite creative with dose titrations and uh, either separate doses, separate from the other meds to get those therapies on board. One thing to sort of keep in mind is to consider decreasing your diuretic dose if the patient is near euvolemic uh, and we're running into problems with blood pressure. It's more important to focus on what it is we can get that doesn't have a mortality benefit, uh, doesn't have an improvement in outcomes, it's just going to decongest. So start looking at your Lasix type therapies. What you have to keep in mind is that your uh, MRA or a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, aldosterone, uh, sorry, aldactone, eplerinone, that's not used for its diuretic properties. It's actually used and it has a mortality benefit. Very important to remember when uh, switching from an ACE uh, to an ARNI that the ACE has to be stopped for 36 hours. Or... Yeah. Hello? I, I get somebody else talking on the line. Um, no, that's okay. I just muted them. Uh, so you get so you want to reduce the incidence of angioedema. Same thing if uh, you put somebody on an ERNI and you have to switch back to an ACE, you have to do that. But if you're going from ARB to an ERNI or an ERNI back to an ARB, you do not need to have that 36-hour washout. With the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists such as aldactone and eplerinone, again they have mortality benefit. They have remodeling uh, benefit. Titration, again, every two weeks as tolerated to reach. And generally in heart function clinics, we do one medication at a time. So it's not an MRA, it's not the ACE, it's not beta blocker all at once. Uh, again, your baseline renal function and potassium. Be creative uh, with your dose titrations. And again, take a cautious look at your... Um, at your other diuretics. Something to uh, keep in mind when you're using aldactrone because of the um, aldosterone effect, uh, men sometimes can develop gynecomastica, uh, actually have a significant increase in breast size, and sometimes it often starts off as sore, tender nipples. So if they come in with their hands up or they're in hospital and they're complaining of it, just sort of keep in mind, do a med review. Sometimes if we switch them from the aldactone to the eplerinone, we don't get that uh, effect uh, from the uh, eplerinone, uh, but it can take a while and sometimes it don't, even, it don't ever go away with the uh, breast enlargement that we see. Beta blockers for uh, the uh, sympathetic nervous system, uh, there's three currently, uh, well here they have two, bisoprolol and carvedilol. The uh, studies that were done initially didn't include uh, just metoprolol uh, BID dosing. It was a CRXL, but we often see uh, within our inpatient cardiology unit of metoprolol up to 100 milligrams uh, twice a day. The bisoprolol uh, start low, again 1.25 milligrams in the carvedilol. A thing to make note of about the carvedilol is that it also has alpha properties, so it can have a little bit more effect on blood pressure and lowering. So if we're having trouble up titrating the meds and they're on carvedilol, we'll often switch them to uh, the more beta selective bisoprolol and see if that will help. And it has, uh, I've been able to get somebody up to 10 of bisoprolol by uh, taking them off to carvedilol and doing that switch out. Generally, we start titrating when the fluid status is stable. Uh, fluid retention is possible with uh, the use of beta blockers. Stagger to time, sometimes you might give the beta blocker at night, the ACE ARB in the morning. Uh, take it with food, slows down absorption. And uh, again, you'd notice that I always keep talking about consider decreasing the diuretic. Not so much from a perspective if the patient is grossly over congested. Um, or volume overloaded, but if they are near euvolemic state. Uh, when we look at uh, other heart rate or uh, slowing medications, Ivabradine came out with the SHIFT trial, and uh, it slows heart rate in addition to uh, what we use for um, regular beta blockers. Uh, and 
it sort of acts in a little different way than slowing conduction. It acts directly on the IF channels in the uh, SA node. And so uh, I'll show you the mechanism of sort of how it works. So we get that additional rate control. So if we have people on goal-directed therapy, heart such as bisoprolol, 10 milligrams maximum dose, we're still getting heart rates above 75, 77, as it indicates in the product monograph on a number of visits to the clinic, uh, then we know that in, a heart rate itself is an independent predictor of worsening outcomes. Uh, so we will actually bring in the Ivabradine to try to achieve that utter rate control. It only works in people who are in sinus rhythm, slows heart rate, it doesn't have the effect on blood pressure like other beta, blo like beta blockers, no effect on contractility, can use in people who have asthma, and no rebound effect if it's stopped um, uh, suddenly. So basically what happens is you're gonna slow the diastolic depolarization slope, as you can see right here, so that's where the next beep sort of would have occurred. Now it's delayed, so you're gonna get that heart rate conduction. And we like to get patients at least less than 17. In our clinic, we try to aim for heart rates between 50 and 60, as long as they're asymptomatic. So you can start with uh, five milligrams. Target is 7.5 twice a day. But what you have to remember is you have to be cautious in people over 75 uh, because it can actually, uh, you may need to lower the dose and start with a lower dose. So very interesting uh, with the CVOT trials that were done uh, back in 2015-2016 with uh, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and, you know, was the safety trials to see about the effect of those medications on people with cardiac disease. And they started noticing that there was uh, an improvement uh, in people who had heart failure. And it was only about 10% of the people back at that point in time who actually had uh, heart failure that were enrolled in those studies. So as a result of that, these are the new recommendations that come out. And of course, uh, right here in the initial one, and initially it was that people who are type two diabetic, you can use either the Ampadkanaga or Depagaflos. And for people with established cardiovascular disease to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Excuse me. Uh, we also recommend SGLT2 inhibitors such as DAPA be used in people with uh, type 2 diabetic greater than 50 with additional risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The Canaga flows in because of the CANVAS trial was for people, or they sort of highlighted that, you know, that may be the one to use in patients greater than 30, type 2 diabetic, and to get macroalbuminaric uh, renal disease to reduce progression of renal disease and heart failure hospitalizations. But down the bottom here, because of the DAPA-HF trial, they made the recommendation that um, SGLT2 inhibitors such as DAPA can be used in patients mild to moderate heart failure, EF less than 40, and with and without uh, type 2 diabetes to improve symptoms and quality of life and reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality. And I have, uh, the DAPA heart failure trial was in 2019 and actually in June of 2020, they actually got the indication in the product monograph too for that indication. Now, along with that, the Emperor, Emperor trial, our uh, Empagliflozin, that was a uh, positive trial as well that came out at the ES, ESC that was released in um, August of this year uh, in the treatment of patients with and without diabetes. So it's very interesting that we got a diabetic medication that now is coming into play in patients with heart failure. And how the medication works is it blocks the SGLT2 receptor, receptor so we get a reduction in glucose reabsorption. So with that, as we uh, urinate or get rid of a lot of glucose, what happens is that we get rid of fluid with it and we get increased glucose urea, naturesis, and osmotic diuresis. So we really decrease the glucose uptake uh, and excrete it and we get rid of volume as well. This is just, again, a uh, sort of little chart that I've done to sort of look at the current uh, guidelines in 2020 and even the doses with the DAPA, EMPA, and the Canaga flows and uh, listed there. So the practical tips, which is sort of uh, an important uh, tip for uh, people in frontline practice is that, of course, we don't use them in type 1 diabetics. The big thing is uh, genital mycotic infections that you have to sort of do patient teaching about. So make sure they really wipe clean down there. Uh, we tell men, especially uh, if they're older, they're having issues with dribbling and urine is going down into the scrotum and that 
that's very important to clean that up. Again, if you're not circumcised, to make sure you pull your foreskin back and uh, wait really well. Because of course, with that high glucose content coming out and staying around, it can cause infection. Same thing for women. Uh, we do have uh, reports of women coming back uh, with the yeast infections and we just give them the antifungal and uh, sort of um, help with that if it's of repetitive of course sometimes we may have to look at even stopping the medication so that's a big teaching point for the patients to let them know because of the high glucose excretion content can decrease uh, EGFR up to 15% so you had to be cautious because it can uh, cause acute kidney injury and of course assess the diuretic dose because now you're going to get rid of a lot more volume uh, and if you can start down titrating the uh, diuretic now will be the time to do it generally don't uh, you're not going to see a, a hypoglycemia in the absence of insulin or sulfonylurea if they are on those medications you, and the uh, hba1c for the patient is less than seven you may actually have to look at doing a dosage reduction on those medications to prevent lows in patients without diabetes of course there's a set point that you get with the excretion of the glucose so you're not going to encounter um, hypoglycemia in those that particular patient group. Caution when combined with Arnie's and other diuretics because of the added diuresis. And very important from a teaching perspective is the sick day management plan. And when we look at that, it's uh, very important to educate patients that if they're going to have uh, an episode or an illness that's going to cause them to be hypovolemic, such as gastrointestinal illness, could be that they're fasting for procedures, uh, colonoscopies in the sort, uh, where they're going to be really dehydrated, increase the risk for their de decline in kidney function, then those medications by the acronym SADMANS, sulfonylureas, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, metformin, ARBs, non-steroidals, and SGLT2 inhibitors that they may have to be stopped. And uh, we actually write down if you do get in this situation and you are not able to drink enough, then you should stop the following medications. And then we will list out, like for example, you're on metformin, you're on glycoside, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories they should not be taking. And you can actually print this uh, uh, right off from the Canadian diabetic association website so sad man's very important in this patient population so we don't want to end up with a situation of diabetic ketoacidosis that they should not be getting those when they have sickness in terms of uh, depletion volume depletion iron deficiency is coming more and more on stream and more and more uh, we're screening for it uh, and the potential for iron deficiency so we know that giving iron in heart failure patients has been known to improve six minute walk test and it's also been uh, shown to improve quality of life scores don't really have the uh, mortality data on how that works but there's currently four trials ongoing that hopefully within the next year or two is going to shed some light on that we know that iron deficiency is uh, a significant uh, issue within the heart failure population uh, and uh, that's diagnosed by ferritins less than 100 or if the ferritin is 100 to 299 with a transect so that's when you do your iron studies and you get your indices uh, is less than 20 percent the reason why you allow for ferritin to go above 100 or up to 100 to 299 is that it is an acute phase reactant. So in inflammatory conditions and in uh, diseases like heart failure, it's not uncommon to see that uh, level elevated. So we treat iron deficiency anemia. The big thing is, is that you get your hemoglobin back. It's 120 in a man. Um, MCV level is less than 80. So you got iron deficiency anemia. It's very important that if you see that trend going down, to actually explore the cause. Iron deficiency anemia is malignant until proven otherwise. So it's very important to get the exploratory cause of what's causing that. And generally we go with IV iron replacement because oral iron is poorly absorbed in heart failure patients. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting and stay tuned for uh, those studies. Uh, just to mention before I get off the drugs, there is another one, uh, the Victoria study and uh, with Vera Sigwat, uh, which is uh, probably you're going to hear more about uh, over the next year or so as well, another trial that was done uh, with a new novel agent in heart failure. 
When we look at uh, device therapy in chronic heart failure, the big thing is differentiating, okay, do they have an ischemic cause, cause for the heart failure? And if they do, and the, uh, we reevaluate their heart function and the EF is less than 35% by reliable method, and of course, uh, gold standard being MRI, also MUGA and echocardiogram, and the patient still got MYHA class two to four symptoms. Uh, and we can send off for a referral for an ICD. If we look at their 12 lead ECG and they got dyssynchrony uh, where they got a left bundle branch block, meaning um, the electricity when it goes from SA node to AV node should go down to right and left bundle branches of the heart at the same time. When it does, or it's blocked on the left, we know that that's a poorer outcome and CRT or pacing will improve. Um, sometimes even the ejection fraction that patient. So we look for a widened QRS, left bundle branch block morphology, and if the ejection fraction is still down, we will actually implant a uh, CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And I got a slide on that to show you what that looks like. Uh, has the patient had optimal therapy for the last three months? So we got them on all their therapies. EF is still down. And again, that's no, they don't have ischemic heart disease, there's a dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, then we look at, do you put in an ICD? And again, if, Q, uh, if the heart function is down, yes. And ICD, uh, QRS, sorry, greater than 130 with left bundle, then we will put in CRT. So people can get CRT devices, not necessarily ICDs. People can get ICDs, not necessarily CRT. ICD, for a patient or an implantable defibrillator is not going to improve heart function. An ICD implanted is a life-saving uh, device that is going to check if the patient goes in a lethal arrhythmia that will actually uh, bring them back. This is an example when I talk about a left bundle branch block, widened QRS. So in essence, what's happening is that the right ventricle is contracting before the left because the impulse comes down here, then it goes from cell to cell all the way over to the left. So there's a delay in depolarization of the left ventricle. When that happens, the right ventricle is going to contract, pushes the septum over into the left ventricle. You're going to get um, poor utilization of the ventricle. And therefore, then we put in what we call cardiac resynchronization. So you get a lead here on the left lateral wall of the left ventricle one here on the right with the whole goal of both ventricles now contracting at the same time. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of questions about uh, how much sodium should one um, eat um, and what's allowable. There's no consensus on international guidelines or around. We know that sodium leads to often patients becoming volume overload, but as to what the exact amount of sodium is within my current practice, I say generally between less than 2000 milligrams per day with the hopes that they can have 500 milligrams of sodium per meal, 500 for snacks in between. It's very interesting because a lot of patients things they can save up. I tell them it's not like Weight Watchers where you can save all your points for Friday night and have at her at the Chinese restaurant for uh, takeout or KFC or in Newfoundland salt beef dinner uh, uh, because we often see bad results with it in terms of volume overload. It's very important to teach patients but understanding their symptoms, especially the importance of daily weight monitoring. Two to three pounds overnight, five pounds in a week. My weight is going up. My food intake is not. That's clinically significant to get in contact with your healthcare provider. Also, educating them on orthopnea measured in pillow usage. So you're jacking up your head higher and higher at night to sleep or you're waking up from sleep short of breath. These are signs that something is going wrong getting with your healthcare provider. Medication adherence is very important. You can't pick and choose what days uh, you're gonna use your medications. I've had uh, some of our male patients stop their beta blockers uh, because they know that it causes erectile dysfunction. So, uh, you know, if they uh, want to sort of reverse that for a bit, sometimes uh, they stop the little blue pill, uh, which would be the metoprolol. Very important for uh, exercise as well to get out, get moving, and cardiac rehab is extremely important if you have availability to get the patient there. And of course, we always recommend the uh, flu and pneumonia vaccines. 
Just a last note on advanced care planning. Uh, we don't often talk about it enough. And we need to start that conversation really early. And generally, I initiate with, you know, we know you got heart failure. This is the situation right now. And this is what we have to offer. But, you know, like if down the road, things didn't start keep going in the direction that we we're going, and we start to see things sort of go in the opposite direction. Have you ever gave any thought of what that would look like or what you would want done? And sometimes if nothing else, it just gets the conversation going. Have you ever spoke to your family members about it? Have you spoke to your spouse? Do your children know what it is that if you want A, B and C done, but you don't want E, F and G done? Uh, who's going to make those decisions for you? So if you get sick, you run into trouble on a particular night, you come into emerge, you can't speak to yourself. Who is it that's going to make those decisions for you? And of course, as we've seen in the trajectory initially, uh, end of life or pain and symptom management often uh, sometimes has come and we're do not always doing a great job of getting patients in that program early for advanced uh, um, sorry, end of life care and providing good symptom management. And more and more, we're looking at, I believe, a Canadian uh, across Canada uh, level to sort of get that more and more incorporated within our uh, clinics. Because, of course, historically, pain and symptom management was reserved in the oncology world, but it is ever expanding into our world as well. And as you can see, with even within the goals of heart failure, management. They talk about advanced care planning and documentation of goals and care. So just a little snapshot, anybody with an ejection fraction of less than 40, which historically we would have treated with uh, goal-directed triple therapy is now beyond that. And we're going to start seeing more and more, I believe, things referred to as combined therapies. We got ACE, ARBs, ARNIs, uh, beta blockers to activate the uh, RAS, uh, sympathetic nervous system, and our uh, uh, natriuretic peptide system. We ha now have SGLT2s, and we have the IF channel blockers, which are um, acts on the funny channels, all for uh, inappropriate doses. So again, it's all about reevaluating the patient. Uh, we get them on all the goal-directed, optimized therapies. Heart function still remains low. Then we look at consideration for device therapy, such as ICD, which is life-saving, CRT, which can improve symptoms. Uh, and then we also have to consider advanced care planning if we've sort of maxed all of our therapies. We're getting more and more troubles with blood pressure control, meaning it's low, patient is symptomatic. We're having to back off on therapies. We can't keep them out of decongested state. Then we may have to start looking at sending a referral to a facility that has more advanced heart failure therapies. So your key take home messages uh, from this is that heart failure is co complex disease with a significant burden of healthcare systems and don't forget the families. All patients generally come with someone attached with them. Make sure that you address their issues as well. Not that we often have some resources or all the resources to help them, but sometimes just let them air what it is that's bothering them about the whole situation. Heart failure management is ever evolving as new therapies become available. Uh, Goal-directed therapy is important in improving heart failure outcomes because it has mortality benefit. Heart failure hospitalizations are decreased and improvements in quality of life. Device therapies impact mortality and improve quality of life as well. And advanced care planning should start early in the disease trajectory so that we can offer the best benefit in symptom control with patients and end of life. Doing advanced care planning or end of life care and providing or sending somebody for pain and symptom management, you're not going to hasten death. It's not going to bring it on quicker. Sometimes those patients will even live longer, but with improved quality of care, there is literature out there to actually substantiate and support that. Now I'm available and free for any questions if somebody has any. Brody, I've been monitoring the chat box and there's all kinds of excellent, lively discussion. So before we go there, great presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. And so before we start with a couple of questions, we're in, in the um, 
interest of time, I would like people to know if you hang to the very end, I will draw for a free CCCN membership. So uh, thank you, Rhody. That was awesome. But I want to read you a couple of, um, of comments and um, questions. So there was a really good discussion about SGLT2 inhibitors and uh, um, Starting, starting those in the presence of diuretics and how, and I know we manage it differently across Canada, um, but the discussion about uh, Patty Staples mentioned that she's had patients lose 10 pounds in the first week when they were started on an SGL2 inhibitor while they were on LASIK. So what is your experience, Rhody, with um, patients on diuretic therapy who then get started on the SGLT inhibitor. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so that's where you sort of got to go with the patient, either they're hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic. If they're grossly volume overloaded, it's uh, not so much of an issue, especially if they got pressure uh, to support it. If we're sort of getting towards that normal volemic state and we are introducing an SGLT2 inhibitor, I will oftentimes decrease that diuretic by 50%. The big thing is educating the patient about uh, significant of weight loss, just like weight gain. If they start feeling symptoms, they're dropping weight very quickly. They lose the same amount of Friday, you start their SGLT2. They got 10 pounds gone by Monday, they're lightheaded. Uh, that they need to be contacting their healthcare provider or the heart function clinic for further advice. So we will often, uh, if they're, like I said, grossly volume overload, not adjust the diuretic. But again, if you see that they're, um, they're close to being euvolemic, we will oftentimes cut that diuretic dose in half. And by diuretic, meaning either the Lasix, hydrochlorothiazide, or Burinix. We wouldn't, the aldactone is not used in this context as a diuretic. Um, another question is, um, I thought aldactone target was 50 milligrams daily. Is that a recent change? Aldactone? Yes. Yeah, no, aldactone only comes in a 25 milligram tablet, 50s and, and 100s. Uh, so sometimes we might start off with 12.5 milligrams. Uh, if we're sort of worried about creatinine, if we're worried about hyperkalemia, just see how the person's going to respond. So if I have somebody with creatinine of around 210, I know that they would probably benefit right-sided heart failure from the anti-aldosterone effect. I will start them off 12.5, uh, see how they respond. Blood work within a week. So if I see them on Friday by the following Wednesday, Thursday, just see what her potassium, see how they respond, see what the creatinine is. Then if we can, we slowly up titrate that as well up to 25 milligrams. Perfect, thank you. And then I think one last question. Um, someone typed in, how slow is slow when you are titrating beta blockers, titrating um, any of your uh, pharmacotherapy? So our goal here in the heart function clinic for all, pretty much standard for all patients that come in, it's pretty much uh, every two weeks. So we do one drug at a time. So we know if we run into trouble, um, we know what, what it is that we have to back off on. So we would do uh, make sure that everybody gets on something, uh, one of each. So for example, the beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, MRA, small doses. So for example, may look like uh, Sopralol 1.25, aldactone 12.5, and your ACE inhibitor of uh, Ramipril 1.25, just pick three. So then the next time they come in, we would up titrate one med and generally uh, we would uh, keep up titrating that one med till we get a maximum dose and again that may come to independent clinical judgment if we're having problems with heart rate we might have to target more of the beta blocker uh, get involved there if it's a hypertension episode then i might be more inclined to go with the ace inhibitor in terms of where the SGLT2 inhibitors come into play in that whole titration scheme there is only one dose so generally we start it the big thing is, is there's no direction as to, okay, you started here early while they're in hospital, you started when out. 
the biggest issue right now is coverage, getting it done. If the patient's got an A1C upwards between nine and 10, maybe a good time because you're gonna get that additional benefit of lowering your A1C, improving glucose control, getting rid of volume so you may be able to down titrate your target diuretic because diuretics are not offering any mortality benefit. It's just used for decongesting. So if we can get something on that's going to add additional mortality benefit, then that may be the better drug to go with. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, I know we could probably have questions for hours and hours, but uh, Rody's presentation will be available. Rody is only an email away. Uh, even though we are a big country, we are very well uh, uh, connected and uh, like I say, Rhodey is really our go-to uh, our go-to guy for entertainment, but also for heart failure um, uh, education. So thank you for that, Rhodey. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invite. Thank you. So Great. see lots of familiar faces as well. It's wonderful, isn't it? So. This brings us to the very end, and I'm sure that people are starting to kind of get a little, oh my God.